Welcome to Mystery Sauce. In today's episode, we'll delve into two chilling tales of medical murder. But before we dive in, don't forget to like and subscribe to our channel. Also, I ask for your understanding regarding my accent. Some words may be more challenging for me to pronounce. So now let's begin. The Kersley Home at Christ Church Hospital in Philadelphia. It is the oldest nursing home in the United States. It was established in 1762. This specialist facility caters to some 60 elderly ladies, each of whom is accommodated in her own apartment. It is an extremely well-run facility, staffed by the most competent and caring personnel. It is hardly the sort of place where you would expect to find a serial killer. And yet, in the first half of 1983, just such a creature stalked the halls, leaving a trail of death in his wake. By the time he was caught, six frail women ranging in ages from 83 to 92 would be dead, brutally assaulted, and suffocated in their beds. Now the first sign of anything amiss came on January 21st, 1983. At the age of 92 years old, Margaret Eckerd was the oldest resident of the home. Yet, despite her advanced age, she was an active and alert individual, much loved by everyone because of her sunny personality. It was somewhat of a surprise then, when she failed to show up for breakfast on that day, on that Friday morning. A nurse was dispatched to Miss Eckert's room and found her lying, unmoving in her own bed. She immediately called for a doctor who confirmed that she was dead. A subsequent examination revealed some worrying signs, including a bruising to the dead woman's face and blood in her mouth and nose. There were also streaks of blood in, in her private area. Despite these findings, the doctor concluded that Miss Eckert had died of natural causes and attributed her death to a heart attack. It was a mistake that would have tragic consequences for five other residents of the home. Now, three weeks later, after Miss uh, Eckert's death, there was another one at the home. Like the previous victim, 85-year-old Catherine Maxwell was first flagged as missing when she failed to join her companions at Brefix. A nurse was sent to check on her and found her lifeless body lying in her own bed. Blood was again noticed around her private area, this time seeping out to stain the dead woman's pajamas. This, however, was attributed to natural causes. How about that, right? And on March 27, 1983, was the 86th birthday of Elizabeth Monroe, another resident at the home. She had spent the day with friends, eating cake and visiting late into the evening. The following morning, a nurse found her dead in her apartment. She had traces of blood on her body. This time, the doctor who did the initial examination was concerned about the presence of blood. But the Philadelphia medical examiner dragged his feet about initiating an investigation. Typical of medical examiners sometimes. By the time things got rolling, Elizabeth's Monroe body had already been embalmed and all the evidence was destroyed. The death was recorded as natural. Then we have 89-year-old Lily Emile. She was one of Kersley's home's most outgoing residents. She was very socially active and even had a boyfriend who visited her regularly from another residential home. So on June 1st, Lily was found immersed in a few inches of water in a bathtub, dressed only in a pair of stockings. There was a quantity of blood in the water, but it was theorized that she had suffered a heart attack while preparing a bath and she had fallen in. The investigation went no further than that. And then a little over a month later, on July 5th, 75-year-old Abby Mortimer was found dead in her apartment. Her private physician was summoned immediately and carried out a post-mortem examination, but had no reason to suspect anything other than a natural death. Then on July 19th, there was a double tragedy at the nursing home. 98 no, I'm sorry, 90-year-old Eugenia Border had only been living at Kersley for a month when she was found dead in her apartment. Blood was noted around her nose, mouth, and her private area. The examining physician refused to sign the death a certificate, certain that Ms. Border had been the victim of foul play. Those suspicions were firmed up just a few hours later when another elderly resident of the home was found dead. 72-year-old Mildred Alston lived right across the hall from Eugenia. She was found lying on her own bed, her panties discarded beside the body, suggesting that she might have been assaulted. That bit of evidence forced the medical examiner into action. 72 hours later, 
the Emmy's office delivered its verdict. Eugenia Border had died of strangulation, while Mildred had suffocated to death. Austin, it merged, had also been robbed. Her diamond ring, wedding band, and purse were missing from her room. Detectives assigned to, to investigate the two apparent murders soon learned of the five strikingly similar deaths that had occurred at the Kersley home. They quickly realized that they were dealing with a serial killer, one who assaulted and murdered elderly ladies. Disgusting. From there, it wasn't too difficult to figure out that the killer must be a member of staff at the home. A stranger wandering the halls would have been noticed immediately. And all 40 employees of the home were questioned but there were none who immediately aroused suspicion. Certainly not Anthony Joner, 22-year-old assistant diet technician who everyone at the home appeared to like. But the investigators got a tip off from one of Joyner's friends. It appeared Joyner had been shooting his mouth off about an assault he committed on a 60-year-old woman who lived in his neighborhood. The detectives did some checking and sure enough, they found an unsolved assault detailed with a tip off. Joyner was immediately arrested and brought in for questioning. Initially, the slightly Bill Joyner denied any involvement in the assault or any of the murders. But under intense questioning, he eventually cracked and blurted out, Okay, okay, I did it. He then went on to relate how he had carried out the murders. According to Joyner, all the murders had been committed at night when he had gotten into arguments with his girlfriend. Angry and frustrated, he had gone out drinking and from there had made his way back to the home where he entered through a cellar window. He then began wandering the halls, not following a deliberate path but looking for unlocked doors, and when he found one, he entered. Finding the occupant asleep, Joyner had subdued her with a pillow over the face, suffocating her into unconsciousness. He then assaulted the victim before finishing her off again with the pillow or a makeshift gallon. All of the victims, with the exception of Lily Emil, had been chosen at random. Miss Emil had been deliberately marked out for assault and murder after she reported Joyner for theft. This was the confession that Anthony signed off on. But the ink was barely dry when he recanted, saying that he had been coerced. Despite these denials, he was charged with seven counts of murder, assault, theft, and other related offenses. Anthony Joyner went to trial on May 1984 and was found guilty of five counts of mur murder and one of manslaughter, given the heinous nature of the crimes, the prosecution argued hard for the death penalty. However, in order for that sentence to be passed, the jurors have to be in unanimous in their decision during the penalty phase. And in this case, they weren't. God knows why. And so Anthony Joyner, one of the most depraved killers in Pennsylvania history, was spared the electric chair, unfortunately. On May 5th, 1984, Judge Edwin Malum sentenced him to life in prison. And it is very Highly unlikely that this scum will ever be released. Story 2 The pictures were shocking, even to homicide, detectives who thought that they had seen it all during their long careers. They had the power to distress, and in one of them, a pretty blonde woman is grinning and giving a thumbs up sign beside the corpse of another. Much older woman. Another shows the blonde with her mouth open, aping at the expression of the, of the deceased. And yet another one shows her with fingers and thumbs cocked like a gun, pointing at the dead woman's forehead. The blonde in the picture was 42-year-old Italian nurse named Daniela Pugali. The picture taken taker has never been named, although it is suspected that it must have been one of Pugali's nursing colleagues. Now Daniela would later issue a statement maintaining that the pictures were intended to be private, that the confident, confidant had posted them online without her knowledge. She admitted that she was guilty of acting in bad taste, but insisted that there was no more to it than that. A patient had died, and she had taken a few inappropriate pictures. That was all. The evidence would tell a complete different story, though. Now, even before the sickening pictures of Daniela Pugali's first came to light, a ministry of the Umberto uh, Hospital in the town of Lugo in northern Italy were alarmed by an unexplained spike in the death rate of patients at the facility. They were particularly concerned by the number of deaths that occurred while Nurse Pugali was on duty. 93 over a period of two years. Three times as many as more of her colleagues. 38 between February and April 2014 alone. It was of course 
quite possible that this sudden elevation was a case of unfortunate happenstances. Hospitals all over the world experience anomalies such as this from time to time. Though there was also talk among the staff, most of it regarding Daniela Pogali, and all of it is just insane and alarming. Many of the nurses spoke of Pogali's malevolent and vindictive personality. Pogali, they said, regularly stole from patients. She fed them sleeping pills so that she wouldn't have to bother with them during her shift. She was just lazy. She was on a power trip. She gave them laxatives just before her shift ended so that the nurses on the next rotation would have to deal with the unpleasant consequences. And when a colleague witnesses Pogali stealing from a patient, Pogali responded by leaving a funeral bouquet on the hood of the woman's car in a mafia-style threat. Perhaps most honestly, Pogali had been heard to comment about troublesome patients. Leave it to me, I'll quiet them. She had even told the doctor pondering what to do about a seriously ill patient. Two vials of potassium and it will all be resolved. That's what she said. Hospital bosses clearly had to address the situation, but they were reluctant to act on a mere insinuation. Pogali was, after all, a competent nurse of 17 years' experience. She was known to her supervisors as hardworking and diligent. And then in March 2014, a series of incidents occurred which forced their hand to act. Over the course of a single week, five patients expired unexpectedly all on her shift. What are the chances? And on one of those was Oriana Crisia. She died on March 31st. Pogali had been asked to attend to the elderly woman when her nasal feeding tube started to leak onto the pillow. And a few minutes later, the patient was dead. For no reason that anyone was able to fathom. When two more patients died while being attended by Pogali on April 4th and April 5th, the hospital ordered autopsies, but found nothing on towards. That perhaps lulled them into a false sense of security but within days, another two patients were dead. And still the response by hospital authorities were tipped. Rather than calling the police, they moved Pogali to the day shift in order to keep a closer eye on her. It made no difference. And on the morning of April 8th, another patient, 72 year old Rosa Calderoni was dead. I could pronounce my Italian names pretty good. And on the morning of her death, Miss Calderoni was being visited by her daughter, Manuela Arci. When a nurse with close cropped blonde hair entered the room and told her to leave as she had things to do, Elsie did as she was instructed. And then she returns 10 minutes later after the nurse had gone. Her mother was now asleep. But Miss Elsie noticed that a small glass vial was hanging from a stand and was being fed into her mother's arm via an IV line. It had almost emptied when Miss Calderoni started twitching manically and her eyes started rolling back. Miss Elsie ran for help, but by the time she returned with a with a nurse, her mother was dead. And guess what? The mystery vial disappeared. Gone. No one saw it. A search was immediately carried out and it was discovered that the two vials of potassium chloride had gone missing from the hospital dispensary. This was not good news. Potassium chloride is a powerful compound which can stop the heart if given in sufficient quantities. It is in fact one of the three drugs used in executions by the lethal injection. It is also not notoriously difficult to detect as it break, breaks down in the human body within hours. So in toxicology reports, it probably won't show up. Now time was of the essence. The hospital ordered an immediate autopsy, focusing on the elderly victim's uh, aqueous humor in an area of the eyeball where the poison is known to accumulate. There, they found a sufficient quantity of the drug to have caused a heart attack. In the in interim, a syringe containing potassium was found in a disposable unit and the dead woman's daughter had identified the nurse who had entered her mother's room. Guess who it was? Daniela Pogali. Finally, the hospital administrators phoned the police and reported a possible homicide. As police initiated their investigation into Rosa Calderoni's death, Pogali was fired from her job, but it would be October 9th before officers eventually arrested her and charged her with murder. Pogali seemed unconcerned by the media storm that followed, and this, indeed, she seemed to lap up all the attention, smiling and waving for the cameras. Her mood was rather less joyful when judges rejected her application for bail in order to be held in custody until the outcome of her trial. And immediately after, Pogali issued a statement via her attorneys in which she apologized for the photographs, which she admitted were in bad taste, 
However, she denied that she had harmed Rosa Calderani or any other patient. As of now, Daniela Pogali remains in prison, which she enjoys a certain notoriety, and is indicted daily with fan mail and marriage proposals. Should she be proven guilty of the charges levied against her, she will go down in history as one of the world's worst medical serial killers. So, that concludes my stories for today. Everyone, if you were intrigued by today's true crime tale, hitting the like and subscribe button would mean a lot to me. Thanks for joining me, and until our next episode, keep it saucy.